welcome to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast, your guide to help you manage life, money, and multiples. Each episode, host Paul Fenner, Tama Capital's president and founder, and the proud parent of four amazing children, including one set of triplets, will provide insights on successfully sustaining an active lifestyle, career, and family through comprehensive wealth management strategies, financial education, and lifestyle planning, specific to parents raising twins, triplets, and more. Learn more, subscribe to the show, or connect with Paul at TamaCapital.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Tama may retain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. If you stop for a moment and thought about your future self, go ahead, take a few minutes. It's not a natural state to think about what your future self may look like, but you could be doing yourself a huge disservice by only thinking about your present self. Mariel Beasley is the co-director of the Common Sense Lab at Duke University, where they focus on helping people make better financial and life decisions based on behavioral science. Science that help us determine how to treat our future self just as well as we do today. Although we may be able to identify and name our shortcomings or biases, Mariel provides a great example around certain physical versus cognitive limitations. Although we build tools to help us overcome these physical limitations, we try to retrain our brains around cognitive limitations. Please enjoy my conversation with Mariel Beasley. Well, Mariel Beasley, welcome to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. I have been looking forward to having this conversation with you for a while. <laughs> Thank you for having me. And as we were talking before we, we, we hit record, I, I made the comment that I could talk to behavioral scientists such as yourself all day, every day, because when I first sit down and, and with a family to talk about what I do, most people think that, oh, we're going to have a conversation about financials and numbers. And they're like, right? And, and they're like, yes. I'm like, no, we're, we're not going to talk about numbers at all. It's like, well, what are we going to talk about? Like, we're going to talk about you and your feelings because your feelings equal money. And uh, that's a, that's probably a good line that I've heard probably from Carl Richards and Dan Ariely, who started the the lab down there at Duke uh, has probably talked about often, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about having that conversation with you. Yeah. And um, it, it, it makes sense to kind of start at that, at that place, because what we know about the psychology of money is, so much of it is driven by emotion. So much of it is driven by um, social norms. I mean, we'll talk about a lot of other things, I'm sure, over the um, the next bit of time. But you know, it's a lot of a lot of our decisions about about money actually are you know it, related to the pain of paying. How do we feel about the separation of cash? Um, and, uh, and so excited to get into the the details with you. So why don't why don't we start with having you walk through your background, who you are, what you do, and we'll, we'll run from there. Sure. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Mariel Beasley, and I am a co-founder of the Common Sense Lab, which is a behavioral science research lab within the Center for Advanced Hindsight at Duke University. And um, the Center for Advanced Hindsight, as you alluded to, is um, Dan Ariely's behavioral science research lab at Duke. And the Common Sense Lab, which is the team that I run, focuses specifically on financial decisions and sort of what influences people's decisions to spend, save, borrow, earn, uh, et cetera. And how can we make changes to products and services to lead to better outcomes in those domains? Um, And so that's what I get to uh, spend all day, every day doing. uh, And I've been doing that for um, the past almost nine years at this point, um, which is very exciting. And before that, um, I've, I've had sort of a, a, a wild and varied career. Um, I, uh, my background is actually in public policy and I worked in uh, actually in Boulder County doing Medicaid enrollment for a while. Um, I did Peace Corps for a couple of years in the Dominican Republic. Um, and, but I've always uh, been drawn to, and this is sort of what brought me to the lab in the first place is I've always been really drawn to this idea of measurement. How do we know what's working, what's not working? And knowing just that small changes can seem to make really big differences 
uh, in, in different places. And, and so we should be tinkering. We should always be constantly trying to sort of make these changes and then making sure that we're measuring those changes so that we know, is this actually working in the way that we expect it to or not? And that's been something that's you know, really followed me throughout my, my career. So, cause I'm, I'm always interested in people's stories, like people, right. When I, and then that's the, that's been the biggest joy of this podcast, Mariel, is that the, the stories that people talk about and I can get from, because people just think, well, I'm just, I just do what I do, but how does one become a behavioral scientist? Like how, how did you talk to, you, you scratched the bare, bare yeah. the bare surface of that, but I want to go a little bit deeper. How does one become a behavioral scientist and how did that work for you? Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's changed a lot over the years, right? I would note that now you can get like degrees in behavioral science and, in and, and you, there's like a master's program at Penn where you can do it. Um, you know, nine years ago, when I first sort of got into the field uh, here at Duke, that, you know, you could do the business school route and do judgment, decision making and things like that. But but for me, um, mine was actually more a little bit chance. So I had studied. Uh, so I went to UNC Chapel Hill for undergrad. And yeah, I was going to bring that up at some point that because there's a lot of uh, Tar Heels that do listen to the podcast. I know so. Yes. So um, that's I, I, I my allegiance is still lie there. Um, so I went there for, for undergrad um, and I studied international studies with a minor in Spanish and German. And I thought I wanted to go work for the State Department. I thought I wanted to do inter- international aid work, um, you know, things like with, with USAID and, and, and whatnot. Um, that's what I thought I wanted to do uh, after I graduated. Um, I knew I, I said, okay, the first thing I need to do is get some real field experience. I need to really know what's going on. And so I wanted to do the Peace Corps. So I signed up for the Peace Corps. Um, it's a long application process. So I actually moved to Colorado and ski bummed for a little while while I did that application process. Um, and then I went to, and then I ended up spending two years in the Dominican Republic as part of the Peace Corps. And while I was there, um, I really got to kind of create a whole bunch of programs from scratch. Um, I got to create an after-school care program for um, third and fourth graders in my community that were at risk of failing. I got to, um, we did a huge project on birth certificates. So a lot of people in the Dominican Republic don't have birth certificates. Um, and so I got to kind of figure out how do I do these things in like a completely different culture, starting from scratch, and how do I set them up to be successful? Um, and so I didn't realize this at the time, but a lot of it was like, think it was actually kind of pulling from behavioral science insights. And it, I didn't, I wasn't super deep in the literature or anything like that, but, you know, I, I thought things like, okay, well, in my, you know, we've got a discipline problem in my, in the after school care program, there's, you know, kids not listening and whatnot. Let's do some sort of a reward system, but instead of actually starting at, you know, where everybody starts at zero and then they earn rewards for good behavior. Let's actually have everybody start at a hundred percent. And then they, they have a, a possibility of losing rewards and, and points. Now, obviously looking back at that now, I was using loss aversion, right? Which we know is a right. powerful, is more motivating for people. I didn't know that at the time, but I was like, I think this will work better. Um, and, you know, and then also doing all kinds of like other aspects of that. The, the birth certificate program, it was a lot around sort of helping people create checklists and defaults and making a process easier and, and simpler and realizing this is what's helping people go through it. But while I was there, I realized that like, I didn't want to just do program implementation because I saw there was lots and lots of problems with that. Lots of cases where people were like, you know, for example, um, in my community, almost every child was sponsored and they would get as part of that child sponsorship program, um, they would get uniforms provided by an NGO for school. The problem was, is that the uniforms didn't arrive until almost a month after school started. And so nobody went to school for the first month because they didn't have their uniforms yet. And they knew they were coming. So they didn't go and figure out other ways to get uniforms to be able to go to school for the first month. So this very well-intentioned program that was supposed to help more kids go to school actually was backfiring and was, was actually preventing kids from going to school for the first month. So this was, I was like, 
And, and, you know, when you sort of were reading about sort of the evaluations of these programs, what they were looking at was just sort of the number of uniforms that they were present, that they were providing as a success metric. Um, and so that got me really interested in like measurement and how do we better understand what works, what doesn't work, how small changes can actually have huge impacts and sort of have unexpected consequences in sometimes positive and sometimes negative ways. So I decided to go back to grad school after Peace Corps. Um, and I actually, I, I did go to Duke um, and if, into a master's in public policy program. And I was like, okay, I, I think I need to take a bigger approach and just pop this, this administrate, this, you know, general administration of, of programs. And I, I want to think on a larger policy level. I enrolled in that um, and found that I really loved my econ classes and I really loved my stats classes. And I like, I sort of dove in more to those. Um, and, you know, I was like, eh, there's some problems with some of these econ models, but I liked sort of the, the I sort of liked the idea that, you know, you could use data and you could um, sort of have this also underlying theory to help sort of predict what happened and then mapping that onto the real world to see then what does actually happen. And we got a little bit of an introduction to behavioral science in some of those courses. But then when I was leaving school, there was an opportunity at the center where they were looking for somebody who had some experience teaching, who had experience in experimental design, which had been sort of something that I had focused on a little bit in like in my in my program. Um, and, you know, somebody who was comfortable reading research and explaining it to, to lay audiences. And it all felt like this was my skill set. So I applied for the job. Um, I, uh, I had actually not read Predictably Irrational. Um, but then I, which is Dan Ariely's um, sort of most famous and famous first book. Yes. First yeah. book. Yep. Um, and so I was like, you know, scanning it quickly, trying it before my, before my interview so that I wouldn't, you know, sound like a complete idiot when I, when I went in there. But as I was in there, I realized I was like, oh, this is stuff that, that, you know, uh, much, much of this stuff I was familiar with on, on a basic level. Um, and, uh, and I was extremely fortunate that, that Dan and the, the center is a place that, um, you know, doesn't just hire on credentials. They hire on whether or not they think you can do the job. And so I often get to joke that while I don't have a PhD, I get to act like I do. Um, and, uh, and, and I get, I have a huge amount of um, sort of autonomy within the lab and, and Dan treats me like any other, um, you know, anybody else that, that, that sort of is deep in the field. And, and I, I get to, I, I get to just read articles all the time and think creatively about how to apply it. And, um, talk about all the cool stuff that, you know, that, that, that research has demonstrated and also conduct our own studies uh, at the same time. So it, I really kind of became a behavioral science scientist through doing rather than through learning. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, so as we kind of transition into to some of the, the, the research that I've read from you and your group and, and Dan, one of the things that, that always fascinates me about working with families is having them think about their future self versus their, their current self. So talk to us about what you've learned on how we help people value their future self just as much that, that they value their, their current self today. Yeah. So it's, first of all, it's, it's like not natural. Um, that's kind of the first thing I, I, I want to say is that it's not it's not natural for most people to equally value their future self as their current self. Um, there are some people that that do have that sort of more as a as an innate characteristic. But what we see pretty broadly is that it's very difficult for most people to really actually identify with their futures with their future self. Um, there's uh, some there's some nice research not done by by us in our lab, but that basically shows that people identify with their future self about as closely as they identify with a stranger. So um, it's it's not, it's not, it, it seems like it should feel automatic, like we should feel close to this sense of our future self, but we don't. And this is because we're present biased. We are, it, it makes a ton of sense from an evolutionary standpoint that we, you know, our survival for a long time relied on us to think about the present, not about the future. Um, because if you are constantly off in the clouds and thinking about the future, you might not survive through the present. So we've, you know, our brain is very much trained and built 
to focus on the here and now, and which makes it extremely difficult to look forward and think forward. Um, there has been some success in getting people to sort of sympathize a little bit more with their future self. And what we've seen is that when you are able to do that, then people do save more for retirement. They do these other activities that, that lead to sort of a more prepared future self. And some of those things are, you know, there's a, there's a pretty well-known study by Hal Hirschman who, um, uh, who, who basically shows that if you take an avatar of someone, so you basically take an image of them, digitize it, and then, um, and then basically age that, that sort of image to, to create this aged avatar, uh, that that makes them sort of, and then you show them this, that makes them feel all of a sudden closer to their future self. And then if you ask them immediately after that, if they want to put more money into retirement, they will. If you wait too long, the effect sort of dissipates. So, so having people imagine that is helpful. We've done a couple other studies where we've tried to, like at our lab, where we've tried to um, sort of think about ways to make that even stronger. Uh, we haven't yet figured that out because it turns out it is, it is pretty tough. Um, but we've done things around like, hobbies. Maybe it's if we get people to also see their older stuff doing the hobbies that they imagine that they'll have. That'll help them feel uh, closer to their future self. Um, we've done, you know, we have actually a build your own avatar and then see what happens uh, and then see it age. And, and how does that make you feel about closer to your future self? And it's, it's tough. Um, we also did things trying to help people imagine their kid's future in order to better save for college because it's not just our, our own future selves is that we also have a hard time sort of planning for the future of those around us. Yeah. How did that go? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So kids naturally help people think a little bit more about the future. Actually. Um, that's one of the nice things about, about kids is that um, kids can actually help people make better decisions for their future self. Because when we naturally think about kids, we naturally think about a little bit more about the future. Um, however, we found that getting people to save for college was very difficult. <laughs> Still very difficult. Still it's, very difficult. Still very difficult. Um, we it's even, like you're, yeah. you're, we're still trying even, and this is the thing with, I've learned about biases. Like I, I, I've studied a lot of biases. I've done you know, all the readings from, um, uh, oh, now I'm going to forget the person's name. Um, that's done all the work on that. and even for, for people that do this for a living that know about the biases, they're like, we're no better off than you are. We, although we know can identify the biases, we can't necessarily overcome them either. And it, it, that's where it comes back to, we're dealing with what millions and millions of years of evolution that we're trying to rewire. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah, I think there's, there's kind of two pieces to that. One is uh, I, I tell people all the time, Danny like, Kahneman. Like, oh, Danny Kahneman. That's oh, like, yeah, how yeah. can I not remember Danny Kahneman? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I tell people all the time that, you know, people all the time are like, oh, you study decision making. You must be really good at it. And, and I say, no, no. I mean, I'm, I'm human. So I'm, I'm just as bad as everyone else. I just have names for it. Right. I yeah. just can identify and say, oh, yeah, well, the reason I didn't do very well on that is because of ostrich effect. Or the reason I didn't do that very well is because of planning fallacy. Right. So I can identify it. That doesn't mean that I'm, not that I'm immune to it. Um, and there's lots and lots of research that shows that you can tell people about anchoring. You can give them, an, you know, there was a, a, a study where, they, where a professor gave an entire lecture about anchoring. And this, is, this happens and this is going to happen to you. And then literally did an anchoring exercise on them. And of course they were influenced by the anchor. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's lots of examples of, of this happening where people can know well about it and it doesn't make it less likely to happen. And the way that I often think about this is that the brain is hardwired in, in, to make these shortcuts, right? Um, to think about the world in this way. And that is a, that is a in many cases, it, it helps us survive in the world, right? If we had to sit down and think through every single choice that we make every day. Yeah, our brains would explode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You wouldn't be able to get out of bed because you'd have to literally every time be weighing the costs and benefits of, should I get out of bed this morning? Should I turn off my alarm? What shoes should I wear? Like, and the, the complexity of each of those decisions, if you're actually going to do sort of a cost benefit analysis for every single one of those, your whole day would be gone before, before you get to breakfast, 
Um, and so in many ways, they help us survive and operate in the world and get things done and thrive as a culture. But they're also, you know, they're also shortcomings, they're limitations. And so in the same way that we have physical limitations, this is a, an analogy that, that uh, Dan actually, uh, Dan Ariely uh, made that, has, that really resonated with me, is that in the same way that we have physical shortcomings and limitations, we don't just try to train those out of ourselves, right? Our bodies cannot fly, right? We cannot just go outside and start flying. That is a physical limitation of human beings. So what do we do? We know that we can't fly. We can't just sit out there and keep trying. Uh, What we do is we build tools that allow us to fly. And it's the same way with, and similarly, you know, we can't, the physical body has a limitation. It can't stand forever, right? You will collapse if you try to stand forever. So what do we've done? We've built chairs, we've built sofas, we've built these tools that allow us to sort of function with these physical limitations. And we haven't, and yet we don't sort of think about these cognitive biases as limitations that need tools. Instead, we're like, oh, we're just going to train it out of us. Well, some of these limitations, you just can't train out. You just actually have to build better tools, knowing that this is a limitation that people have. I and that's never of thought about it that way. That is, and again, this is why I could probably interview an baby. A behavioral scientist every week on this show because I I think maybe you've, the third or fourth one I, I've I've had on the show and you've all have been amazing because you all you all bring something different to the table even though you may be talking about the same topic like you boom lay out this example of like we have physical limitations we have cognitive limitations you know with our physical limitations we're trying to b- build tools. Why don't we try to build tools for our cognitive biases as well, rather than train them out? I think that's, I think that's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. And so when we think about that sort of applying to getting people to sort of value their future self is, you know, you're, you're not going to get that limitation out, right? People are always going to sort of prioritize their current self, but what you can do is say, well, let's do things like where we automatically enroll people in retirement savings where you know, we didn't have to change to get them to actually value their future self more, but we've used other tools in our toolkit, like automatic enrollment to a, to a 401k, that now is helping them protect that future self without needing them to personally say, yes, I value my future self. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, and I'm glad you brought up the work by Hal Hirschfield because I was when you were talking about that, I'm like, I know that that I've <laughs> that's the thing I've read so much in research and catalog. I'm like, it, all the authors kind of run together, it seems like these days, but I'm glad that you brought that up because even if you can try to eliminate some of those daily decisions and, and put in a habit, a good habit, because there's bad habits obviously as well, yeah. then it's a way to help I think maybe use the term short circuit or rewire your brain to make it easier on you. Totally. And, and it's, it's, you know, these, these shortcuts, it's about smart automation, right? How do we make it easier to do the right thing? Um, And it's also about, you know, providing immediate benefits for, for sort of behaviors that wouldn't normally realize any benefits until much longer down the line. Um, another sort of classic example that I, I love in this space is, is toothbrushing. Um, toothbrushing, there's, there's not a lot of things that as, you know, humans. Well, actually- you have my attention, Marielle, because I've been fighting with my triplets plus one on this for years. <laughs> well, here's, the, the, here's, here's what we found from a behavioral science standpoint. There's very few things that people that most people consistently do that is very good for their long-term health. There's, it's just, as a population, there's very few things that most people do. There's the couple of examples are wearing seatbelts in cars. That's something that actually is very widespread. Lots and lots of people do this. It's good for your long-term well-being, even if it's sort of annoying or uncomfortable or whatever in your, in, in the short term. And the second one is toothbrushing. We have extremely high rates of toothbrushing in the United States. It's wonderful. It's great. 
Um, and the, you know, teeth are an incredible, incredibly important component of your overall health. Now, toothbrushing really took off as like an, something that people did all the time was when, was when mint got added to toothpaste. Now, this is, seems a little bit strange maybe, but if you ask most people, if you say, imagine you're packing for a trip and you have not, and you're going to forget either your toothbrush or your toothpaste. And imagine you're going out in the middle of the woods. So you're not going to be able to like pick up a spare and you can only bring one. Would you prefer that you have remembered your toothbrush or would you prefer that you remembered your toothpaste for this trip? I'd take the toothpaste. Yeah. Everybody says the toothpaste, right? The truth is, is the toothpaste has almost no additional benefit to the actual jet, like oral health. That all of the cavity prevention, all of that like long-term dental health that's so important that toothbrushing helps with is in the brush. It's in the, oh, wow. <laughs> um, but the reward, the immediate benefit is the toothpaste. Because of the taste. Because it gives us minty, fresh breath, everything. And what it was when mint got added that gives us that like clean feeling. Yeah. It gives us that immediate feedback that we've done the right thing. Um, it, we like, we almost like start to crave the mint, like, you know, it gets to be a certain time of the day. And it's like, well, I've had, I've had this coffee. It's really time to yeah. really wanting something to, to fix the mint. Um, and so that added it, we call that, you know, reward substitution where you're giving people an immediate benefit that really doesn't actually, that, that just helps you adhere to the behavior to, to give you the long-term benefit, which, you know, good oral hygiene is. And so that's like one of my just favorite examples is that anytime you want somebody to do something like in the financial domain, pay off your debt faster, right? Um, you know, get, get your credit card debt under control in, you know, plan for, you know, go through estate planning, actually, you know, put money into retirement. All of those things are like kind of painful things to do right now, but have huge benefits in the future. You want to think with any of those processes, where is the mint? What am I adding to this process that's going to make this sort of give people immediate feedback that they're doing the right thing, that's going to give some sort of enjoyment um, and that, that satisfies a, an immediate need right now? I, I always, when during the conversations, I'm always thinking about what the title of the show is going to be. <laughs> and this one may be, where is the mint in life planning? <laughs> that, that may be it. Um, Cause I was going to come back to some, of, and I, I think we will come back to, I, I wanted to ask a question, like some of the best practices of what's called just in time financial education. Cause I, I've been doing some research on that. But before, before I get there, one of the um, really meaty subjects I've been working on over the last, I'd say, three to four years, even before COVID, and then I think it just accelerated during COVID as people really started evaluating their lives. I mean, if there was one silver lining or good thing that I've seen come out of COVID is people have kind of slowed down. And, and took stock of what I really want to do with life. And one of the things that I personally struggle with is this definition of what is enough. Like always, and I, I faced that in my corporate career, and I face that now with a growing, you know, family office, wealth planning firm at Tama. And I've, I've seen my clients face that as well. And so I'm, I'm curious to, to find out, Mariel, if you've done work around helping people define what is enough and how that's translated? Yeah. So um, it's an extremely difficult question. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that there's any like very specific projects that we've done uh, around this, this idea of what is enough. Um, but what we do know is just as a field, um, is that social comparison is um, is a, a key determinant in our own satisfaction. And what this means is that it's we don't think about things in in sort of a vacuum. Everything is relative, and so 
our concept of what enough is, is generally not being evaluated in any type of a rational way of saying like, okay, the math works out that this is going, that this is going to last me and my family enough time. What it is, is it's, it's looking at this in comparison to peers. Um, there's a study, um, there's a study that shows that like, that, that men are happier if they earn more money than their brother-in-law, even if like it's actually relative, even if in absolute dollars, it's less dollars than if they were to earn less than their brother-in-law, but more dollars. So this comparison point is a huge driver of satisfaction. And, and I would, I would venture to say that it also constructs our concept of enough. Um, And so it's our comparison and, and, and so when we think about how do we people, how do we help people think about what enough is, is trying to help them identify what's the appropriate comparison group for themselves. Because, you know, social, you know, the social comparison and, and social norms in general are, are extremely powerful in helping us understand how, how we should feel about the world. Now, oftentimes what happens in the financial domain is that consumption behavior is visible. Positive financial behavior is invisible. I know our audience can't see me or see us, obviously, because <laughs> it's a podcast, but I just gave like the biggest smile to Mariel because I'm like, oh, I know where you're going. And, and to be honest with you, I get this question all the time because it's the keeping up with the Joneses where the neighbor next door to you just rolls in with a brand new car and everybody in the neighborhood's asking, how in the hell did they afford that? How did they, how did they do this? And when I sit down with families for annual reviews or just, you know, conversations, it all, the, the, the framework of the questions kind of start with there. I'm like, how do, how do other people do it? And especially with family. So, you know, everybody knows I'm a family of six. I got, you know, me and Teresa and our triplets plus one, but all the, I think this is the thing that people are constantly struggling with fam, families, I should say. And that was before we had 8% inflation today, we're recording this in, in June of 2022. Um, but it still feels like a lot of people, even though they're, they could be making a hundred thousand dollars a year, both, you know, partners or spouses. So they have a $200,000 income, which puts them way, way in the top percentile of most Americans, but yet they feel like they're still struggling. And I think part of that is this social comparison because you have things like Facebook that's a human highlight reel of everybody's positives. And yet people don't know that they just spent that to to go on that vacation, $20,000 on their credit card. They don't know that they're in $100,000 of debt or they're not contributing anything to a 529 for their you know, kids or their retirement plan. To your point, people don't see that. They just see the vacation, the car, the sporting events, whatever it may be. Exactly. And that's, you know, you, you exactly nailed it right. You know what car your neighbors drive. You probably have no idea what their life insurance policy is. You probably have no idea how much money they're putting into retirement. And so essentially what happens is that all of the social cues that we get in society, um, is, is consumption cues, right? It's people eating out. We don't see the people that are at home. We see the people that are eating out. We see the people that are, you know, and, and as you mentioned, right, social media, Instagram, and Facebook have amplified that problem because now it's not just your immediate neighbors. It's your child, you know, people you went to high school with that you haven't talked to in 30 years that you wouldn't be paying attention to if it weren't for Facebook. Facebook. It's, it's, you know, the, it's the Instagram um, you know, the, the influencers who are constantly posting and, and have huge followings and all of that sort of fuels this consumption and this sense of like, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more. Um, and, and so that's, that's really tough. And so when we think about how do we help people think about enough, it's how do we help them identify a better comparison group? Um, and that's actually been something that, that, uh, some, some colleagues of ours have done some, some, um, more qualitative research space in this, they actually found that they found that that many people during COVID started rather than doing upward comparisons, they started doing downward comparisons. And so, 
the upward comparison is, is sort of saying, oh, I want to aspire to be, I, I, I see all these people that are doing better than me. That's the group I want to be a part of. Um, and so you start being like, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have as much as them. I don't have as much as, as them. Um, and so that's why I have this drive for, for needing more. And, and essentially what was happening during COVID is that many people said, at least I'm doing better than them. Because it all of a sudden became so public and in the news and everywhere about all these people who were losing their jobs, you know, having hours cut back. People had family members that were, were economically impacted. And so a lot of people that weren't negatively impacted were able to, were actually kind of shifting and looking and, and seeing that downward comparison, in which case they actually started feeling much better about their own financial security. And so people that from an objective level, you might say, you should be really worried about your financial status because, you know, they, in your financial stability, because they don't have much in savings are not necessarily planning for the future, but they actually felt more financially secure because they were making the downward comp comparison and saying, I know so many other people that were so negatively impacted and at least we weren't. So my finances are in a better place. Um, so I, I think just helping people find a relevant comparison group to benchmark where they are and where they should be is, is extremely helpful in helping people think about what is enough. Okay. That is, that is very interesting. Cause I was just going to circle back to that. If there was like one thing that you could do, it would be that find the correct comparison point. How, is, do you, would you happen to know, Mariel, like how, like what's the best way to do that? Is there, is there a best way to do that? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know exactly, um, but I would take that say, back to the lab and find out. I know I'll do some research on that. Um, yeah, I, I I think that asking people to sort of think more broadly about about who they know, whose life they like, right? And and then basically, people don't. This is the other challenge: is people don't think about opportunity costs. Mm, so when you yes. ask people to think about people who's who they know, whose life they like, um, you know, get them to think more broadly than just the income that they have, right? You like the fact that they get to spend so much time with their kids on weekends. You like the fact that they are, you know, that they actually, they disconnect from work um, at, when they when they come home. So think about sort of what are the, the values and people that they know that have that. Um, and, and, and then sort of also bring instances and cases of, of you know, well, if this is what you want. These are the trade-offs that, that, that have to happen. Um, and I think that that's helpful, you know, allowing, we just naturally don't think about opportunity costs. Um, and so as a financial advisor or, or somebody who's sort of helping somebody come think through this stuff, helping them think about those opportunity costs, uh, I think is helpful. So the, the last topic I wanted to get to, I'm looking at the time, I'm like, the, 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 the minutes just evaporate, I swear. Um <laughs> Is and, and I, I touched on this about this just in time financial education because I think this is another really hard area for people to get their arms around because a family could know that they need help, but they may not necessarily know like what help they need because you don't know what you don't know, and then more importantly, like who to turn to because let's face it, Ponzi schemes get you know, they're, they're in the media a lot more than good financial advice and good financial advisors are. And yeah. so I see a lot of people just prolong, procrastinate, wait, wait, wait until some trigger, some, some tipping point in their life. It doesn't matter. It could be death of a loved one, um, changing careers, losing a job, getting married, like some of the big life transitions. Cause I, and that's another point we could talk about all day long. I think our life transitions, because I know, I think that's a very, um, uh, sub, a very good subject that people underestimate people underestimate the number of life transitions they go to go through and, and, and are unprepared for some of them. And so on this financial education, I think people really struggle with finding that rather than being a procrastinator, they're becoming more active in finding what they need to in order to help potentially solve problems but they that they may not even know about. So I guess where I'm going with this is what what is your experience from the research standpoint say or help how how does that help 
somebody or how can I help somebody get to the table faster to have conversations rather than being five, 10 years down the road and sometimes just being too late? Yeah. So, um, so this is, you know, the, the, the sort of movement towards just in time financial education, of course, comes out of uh, a good deal of research that shows that financial education, um, as a standalone, right. Just trying to, to sort of teach basic principles of, of financial education have a very rapid decay. Um, it, people don't hold on to the information for very long. People have a hard time actually applying it outside of just having just learned it in the course. Um, and there's a, a lot of evidence that just shows that it's it's not incredibly in fact effective as a standalone to change behavior. And so the just in time financial education is really around um, the is really around how do we give people the information that they need in the moment that they are making the decision that would use that information. Um, so this is things like in the moment that somebody is is um, like looking at buying a house. That's when you teach them about, um, you know, about the what is an adjustable rate mortgage versus a, a fixed mortgage. What is the what is the, the difference in trade offs between a fifteen year mortgage and a thirty year mortgage? That it's in that moment that they're actually then making a decision about the mortgage that they'll take out. Because if you're trying to teach a high school kid this, by the time they're actually buying a house, yeah, none of that stays with them and influences their decision in any way. So. Um, so it's really about sort of pairing financial education with products and decisions rather than as a, as a standalone. Um, and there is, you know, it's, it's, it basically means that, it, I mean, it's very difficult then to try to get some, to, to do it before somebody's interacted with a product, right? It's very difficult to do it when, um, you know, the, you know, if you're the, the financial advisor or the financial planner and you're you're basically trying to get them to think about, you know, doing this to come in 10 years earlier than when they're actually saying like, oh, I should start thinking about my retirement. Very difficult to do that. Much, much easier for it to be at sort of a natural moment where people should be making decisions about this. So um, that, for example, is in an HR department when somebody first starts a job. That is a classic place where you should actually, in that moment, have just-in-time financial education about retirement contributions, about planning for those things. Uh, um, you know, you mentioned these life transitions and these these life moments um, when somebody is finds out that they're that they're pregnant and expecting, or or that they are going to have a, a child, or when they buy a house or a, another type of asset. That's a just-in-time education moment to say, you're having this, this life change. Now's the time to also get life insurance and to start thinking about what that, that looks like. Um, and so it's, it's, it's sort of trying to time, this is when decisions should be made about this. So this is also when we're providing information about it. Um, and there are, as you said, there's natural moments that cause people to stop and think about that. Um, and the, the, the good news is that, you know, well, I guess the bad news is those, those natural moments often aren't fre frequent enough, right? Um, everybody buys flood insurance after the flood. Um, but how do you get people to, you know, have bought it before? And uh, the good news is, though, that you can actually help people create moments. And so this was actually a study that we did run um, where we were trying to get people to sort of make a decision about their, um, uh, essentially this was, it was with Silver Nest, which um, helps pair older folks who have a house with older folks who are looking for affordable rentals. And so it's basically a matchmaking service um, to That's help. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's uh, not match, matchmaking in a romantic sense, but in, yeah. a, in a housing sense, because a lot of times people have a home, they're older now, the home is probably larger than what they need but they have emotional attachment to it. They don't want to downsize. They're more likely to be on a fixed income. So having additional rental income is helpful, but they don't want to take on like a 20 something roommate, um, all of these things. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's sort of matchmaking in that sense. It's, it's called silver nest. Um, and so we actually kind of did some, some push out for folks where we basically um, created a moment for people to say, Hey, now's the time to check in on your finances. This was through Facebook ads. 
Um, and we basically told some people, you are 64 turning 65. Uh, think about your finances. Now's a good time to consider taking on a roommate. Um, and so now that seems kind of silly. And this was, they were targeted all to like people who were 64. And some of them, we said that. And some of them, we just said, you're getting older. Think about this. When we said you're 64 turning 65, that meant something to people. That was a trigger. Yep. Telling people, because 65 feels like something meaningful, right? Um, and similarly, uh, we have pretty strong hypotheses that if you are, you've got young people, if you target people who are 29 and say you're 29 turning 30, now is the time to think about your finances. Um, that there are these sort of life, lifetime milestones um, and birthdays in general are, are important, but these round birthdays are especially important mm -hmm. because, you know, people are like, oh, I'm turning 30. I'm supposed to have my life together. Now is a time that they are going to be more receptive to actually receive some of that information about what they should do and then act on that. And that's what you want to do with just-in-time financial education is that you're providing that information in the moment that they need it and then immediately providing uh, actually actions that they can take with that new information. So it's, it's saying, Hey, you're 29 turning 30. You should set up your account of where you're going to be saving to put in a down payment for a house. And you should also be, you know, saving for retirement starting now because you got to, or, you know, hopefully starting a lot before now, but <laughs> worst case scenario, if you haven't started now, you should definitely be starting now because at 30, you're supposed to be kind of getting your life together. Um, and, and then say, do these actions now. Here's the links to click. Here's the, 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 the stuff to do it. Well, Mariel, um, I could keep going on forever, but I know we, we have limited time. So <laughs> I want to, I want to get to my, my closing question that I ask all of our guests. And this one's really kind of cool for you because, uh, you're expecting your ch second child. But my question is, what is the best thing about being a parent? That is such a difficult question <laughs> because uh, actually every minute of it has been actually such a joy. I know that they, there's research that shows that like your happiness actually declines after you have children. Um, That's true. I, I'll, I, I will agree sometimes with that. <laughs> <laughs> For us so far, um, our experience has been that it's been an absolute, an absolute joy. And I think one of the things that uh, is particularly fun um, thinking about human behavior, that's such a, a joy with parents is actually seeing the leaps and bounds of development. Um, and, you know, where just, and, and like being able to sort of watch in real time, somebody kind of work something out and gain a new skill. And it, it's like, sometimes it's like yesterday you weren't walking. And now all of a sudden today you are like running across the living room. Like how did this happen? And so being able to kind of see that development happen in leap of, leaps and bounds, it, it sort of creates such a sense of progress and accomplishment and, and positive feedback that that's just been a real joy. I have, I have had this conversation over 70 times now. <laughs> and I, I love the question because usually I get that first response where like, oh my God, that's like the hardest question ever to answer. But everybody's response is, is always different. It's always nuanced. It's always very personal. And that's what this show has become. It's become uh, very personal for personal for me and, and all of my guests such as you that have been on and it's the feedback's been great. And I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time to be on here. And I'm, uh, I'm sure we're going to stay in close contact and uh, I think you'll be back on here soon. What, so I, I, let me ask uh, a personal question. What are you due? <laughs> uh, I'm due in uh, mid August. Okay. So two months, two months Couple away. Months. All yeah. right. So I think the time to have you back on would be maybe at the beginning of next year after uh, <laughs> you've had some time with uh, two, two little ones at home. Yeah. I've heard that it's not a linear uh, growth and effort that, that actually it's, it's multiplies that it's not just yeah. like, Oh, it's twice the work. It's like, no, four times <laughs> the work. So. <laughs> well, Mary, I'll thank you again for being on the emotional balance sheet podcast. And uh, we'll look forward to those conversations to come. Thanks so much. Paul. have a great day. Thank you for listening to this episode of the emotional balance sheet podcast. 
Please visit TamaCapital.com to subscribe to this podcast or to connect with certified financial planner and registered investment advisor, Paul Fenner of Tama Capital. And please join us again next time on the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. 